He knows he is dead. What? cried the old woman. She came up near, and peering at her daughter, repeated three times, What do you say? Susan sat dry-eyed and stony before Madame de Veillet, who contemplated her, feeling a strange sense of inexplicable horror creep into the silence of the house. She had hardly realized the news, further than to understand that she had been brought in one short moment face to face with something unexpected and final. It did not even occur to her to ask for any explanation. She thought, accident, terrible accident, blood to the head, fell down a trap door in the loft. She remained there, distracted and mute, blinking her old eyes. Suddenly, Susan said, I have killed him. For a moment, the mother stood still, almost unbreathing, but with composed face. The next second, she burst out into a shout. You miserable madwoman, they will cut your neck. She fancied the gendarmes entering the house, saying to her, We want your daughter, give her up. The gendarmes with the severe, hard faces of men on duty. She knew the brigadier well, an old friend, familiar and respectful, saying heartily, To your good health, madame, before lifting to his lips the small glass of cognac out of the special bottle she kept for friends. And now... She was losing her head. She rushed here and there, as if looking for something urgently needed, gave that up, stood stock still in the middle of the room, and screamed at her daughter, Why? Say! Say! Why? The other seemed to leap out of her strange apathy. Do you think I am made of stone? She shouted back, striding towards her mother. No, it's impossible, said Madame Lavelle in a convinced tone. "'You go and see, mother,' retorted Susan, looking at her with blazing eyes. "'There is no money in heaven, no justice, no. I did not know. Do you think I have no heart? Do you think I have never heard people jeering at me, pitying me, wondering at me? Do you know how some of them were calling me? The mother of idiots. That was my nickname.' And my children never would know me, never speak to me. They would know nothing, neither men nor God. Haven't I prayed? But the mother of God herself would not hear me. A mother. Who is accursed? I or the man who is dead? Eh? Tell me. I took care of myself. Do you think I would defy the anger of God and have my house full of those things? that are worse than animals who know the hand that feeds them, who blasphemed in the night at the very church door, was it I? I only wept and prayed for mercy, and I feel the curse at every moment of the day. I see it round me from morning to night. I've got to keep them alive, to take care of my misfortune and shame, and he would come. I begged him and heaven for mercy. No, then we shall see. He came this evening, I thought to myself. Ah, again. I had my long scissors. I heard him shouting. I saw him near. I must. I must. Then take. And I struck him in the throat above the breastbone. I never heard him even sigh. I left him standing. It was a minute ago. How did I come here? Madame Lavier shivered. A wave of cold ran down her back, down her fat arms, down her tight sleeves, made her stamp gently where she stood. Quivers ran over the broad cheeks, across the thin lips, ran amongst the wrinkles at the corners of her steady old eyes. She stammered, You wicked woman, you disgrace me, but there, you always resembled your father. What do you think will become of you in the other world, in this? Oh, misery. She was very hot now. She felt burning inside. She wrung her perspiring hands, and suddenly 
starting in great haste, began to look for her big shawl and umbrella, feverishly, never once glancing at her daughter, who stood in the middle of the room following her with a gaze distracted and cold. Nothing worse than in this, said Susan. Her mother, umbrella in hand and trailing the shawl over the floor, groaned profoundly. I must go to the priest, she burst out passionately. I do not know whether you even speak the truth. You are a horrible woman. They will find you anywhere. You may stay here or go. There is no room for you in this world. Ready now to depart, she yet wandered aimlessly about the room, putting the bottles on the shelf, trying to fit, with trembling hands, the covers on cardboard boxes. Whenever the real sense of what she had heard emerged for a second from the haze of her thoughts, she would fancy that something had exploded in her brain without, unfortunately, bursting her head to pieces, which would have been a relief. She blew the candles out, one by one, without knowing it, and was horribly startled by the darkness. She fell on a bench and began to whimper. After a while she ceased, and sat listening to the breathing of her daughter, whom she could hardly see, still and upright, giving no other sign of life. She was becoming old rapidly at last. During those minutes she spoke in tones unsteady, cut about by the rattle of teeth, like one shaken by a deadly cold fit of ague. I wish you had died little. I will never dare to show my old head in the sunshine again. There are worse misfortunes than idiot children. I wish you had been born to me simple, like your own. She saw the figure of her daughter pass before the faint and livid clearness of a window. Then it appeared in the doorway for a second, and the door swung to with a clang. Madame Leveille, as if awakened by the noise from a long nightmare, rushed out. Susan, she shouted from the doorstep. She heard a stone roll a long time down the declivity of the rocky beach above the sands. She stepped forward cautiously, one hand on the wall of the house, and peered down into the smooth darkness of the empty bay. Once again she cried, Susan, you will kill yourself there. The stone had taken its last leap in the dark, and she heard nothing now. A sudden thought seemed to strangle her, and she called no more. She turned her back upon the black silence of the pit, and went up the lane towards Plumar, stumbling along with somber determination, as if she had started on a desperate journey that would last, perhaps, to the end of her life. A sullen and periodic clamor of waves rolling over reefs followed her far inland between the high hedges sheltering the gloomy solitude of the fields. Susan had run out, swerving sharp to the left at the door, and on the edge of the slope crouched down behind a boulder, a dislodged stone went on downwards, rattling as it leaped. When Madame Lavalle called out, Susan could have, by stretching her hand, touched her mother's skirt, had she had the courage to move a limb. She saw the old woman go away, and she remained still, closing her eyes and pressing her side to the hard and rugged surface of the rock. After a while, a familiar face with fixed eyes and an open mouth became visible in the intense obscurity amongst the boulders. She uttered a low cry and stood up. The face vanished, leaving her to gasp and shiver alone in the wilderness of stone heaps. But as soon as she had crouched down again to rest, with her head against the rock, the face returned, came very near appeared eager to finish the speech that had been cut short by death only a moment ago. She scrambled quickly to her feet and said, Go away, or I will do it again. The thing wavered, swung to the right, to the left. She moved this way and that, 
stepped back, fancied herself screaming at it, and was appalled by the unbroken stillness of the night. She tottered on the brink, felt the steep declivity under her feet, and rushed down blindly to save herself from a headlong fall. The shingle seemed to wake up. The pebbles began to roll before her, pursued her from above, raced down with her on both sides, rolling past with an increasing clatter in the peace of the night. The noise grew, deepening to a rumor, continuous and violent, as if the whole semicircle of the stony beach had started to tumble down into the bay. Susan's feet hardly touched the slope that seemed to run down with her. At the bottom, she stumbled, shot forward, throwing her arms out, and fell heavily. She climbed up at once and turned swiftly to look back, her clenched hands full of sand she had clutched in her fall. The face was there, keeping its distance, visible in its own sheen that made a pale stain in the night. She shouted, Go away! She shouted at it with pain, with fear, with all the rage of that useless stab that could not keep him quiet, keep him out of her sight. What did he want now? He was dead. Dead men have no children. Would he never leave her alone? She shrieked at it, waved her outstretched hands. She seemed to feel the breath of parted lips, and, with a long cry of discouragement, fled across the level bottom of the bay. She ran lightly, unaware of any effort of her body. High, sharp rocks, that when the bay is full, show above the glittering plain of blue water, like pointed towers of submerged churches, glided past her, rushing to the land at a tremendous pace. To the left, in the distance, she could see something shining, a broad disk of light, in which narrow shadows pivoted round the center, like the spokes of a wheel, she heard a voice calling, Hey, there! and answered with a wild scream, so he could call yet. He was calling after her to stop. Never. She tore through the night, past the startled group of seaweed gatherers who stood round their lantern, paralyzed with fear at the unearthly screech coming from that fleeting shadow. The men leaned on their pitchforks, staring fearfully. A woman fell on her knees and, crossing herself, began to pray aloud. A little girl with her ragged skirt full of slimy seaweed began to sob despairingly, lugging her soaked burden close to the man who carried the light. Somebody said, The thing ran out towards the sea. Another voice exclaimed, And the sea is coming back. Look at that spreading puddles. Do you hear, you woman, there? Get up! Several voices cried together, Yes, let us be off. Let the accursed thing go to the sea. They moved on, keeping close round the light. Suddenly a man swore loudly. He would go and see what was the matter. It had been a woman's voice. He would go. There were shrill protests from women. But his high form detached itself from the group and went off running. They sent an anonymous call of scared voices after him. A word, insulting and mocking, came back thrown at them through the darkness. A woman moaned. An old man said gravely, Such things ought to be left alone. They went on slower, shuffling in the yielding sand, and whispering to one another that Millet feared nothing, having no religion, but that it would end badly some day. Susan met the incoming tide by the raven islet and stopped, panting with her feet in the water, she heard the murmur and felt the cold caress of the sea, and calmer now could see the somber and confused mass of the raven on one side and on the other the long white streak of moline sands that are left high above the dry bottom of Fugiri Bay at every ebb. She turned round and saw, far away, along the starred background of the sky, the ragged outline of the coast. Above it, nearly facing her, appeared the tower of Plumar Church, a slender and tall pyramid, shooting up dark and pointed, 
into the clustered glitter of the stars. She felt strangely calm. She knew where she was and began to remember how she came there and why. She peered into the smooth obscurity near her. She was alone. There was nothing there, nothing near her, either living or dead. The tide was creeping in quietly, putting out long impatient arms of strange rivulets that ran towards the land between ridges of sand. Under the night, the pools grew bigger with mysterious rapidity, while the great sea, yet far off, thundered in a regular rhythm along the indistinct line of the horizon. Susan splashed her way back for a few yards without being able to get clear of the water that murmured tenderly all around, and suddenly, with a spiteful gurgle, nearly took her off her feet. Her heart thumped with fear. This place was too big and too empty to die in. Tomorrow they would do with her what they like. But before she died, she must tell them, tell the gentleman in black clothes that there are things no woman can bear. She must explain how it happened. She splashed through a pool, getting wet to the waist, too preoccupied to care. She must explain. He came in the same way as ever and said just so. Do you think I am going to leave the land to those people from Morbihan that I do not know? Do you? We shall see. Come along, you creature of mischance. And he put his arms out. Then, messieurs, I said, before God, never. And he said, striding at me with open palms, there is no God to hold me. Do you understand, you useless carcass? I will do what I like. And he took me by the shoulders. Then I, messieurs, called to God for help. And next minute, while he was shaking me, I felt my long scissors in my hand. His shirt was unbuttoned, and by the candlelight, I saw the hollow of his throat. I cried, let go. He was crushing my shoulders. He was strong, my man was. Then I thought, no, must I? Then take. And I struck in the hollow place. I never saw him fall. The old father never turned his head. He is deaf and childish, gentlemen. Nobody saw him fall. I ran out. Nobody saw him. She had been scrambling amongst the boulders of the raven, and now found herself, all out of breath, standing amongst the heavy shadows of the rocky islet. The raven is connected with the mainland by a natural pier of immense and slippery stones. She intended to return home that way. Was he still standing there, at home, home, four idiots and a corpse? She must go back and explain anybody would understand. Below her, the night or the sea seemed to pronounce distinctly, Aha! I see you at last. She started, slipped, fell, and without attempting to rise, listened, terrified. She heard heavy breathing, a clatter of wooden clogs. It stopped. Where the devil did you pass? said an invisible man hoarsely. She held her breath. She recognized the voice. She had not seen him fall. Was he pursuing her there dead, or perhaps alive? She lost her head. She cried from the crevice, where she lay huddled. Never, never. Ah, you are still there. You led me a fine dance. Wait, my beauty. I must see how you look after all this. You wait. Millet was stumbling, laughing, swearing meaninglessly out of pure satisfaction, pleased with himself of having run down that fly-by-night. As if there were such things as ghosts, bah! It took an old African soldier to show those clodhoppers. But it was curious. Who the devil was she? Susan listened, crouching. He was coming for her, this dead man. There was no escape. What a noise he made amongst the stones. She saw his head rise up, than the shoulders, he was tall, her own man. His long arms waved about, and it was his own voice sounding a little strange because of the scissors. She scrambled out quickly, rushed to the edge of the causeway, and turned round. The man stood still, 
on a high stone, detaching himself in dead black on the glitter of the sky. Where are you going to, he called roughly. She answered, home, and watched him intensely. He made a striding, clumsy leap onto another boulder and stopped again, balancing himself, then said, Ha ha, well, I am going with you. It's the least I can do. Ha ha ha. She stared at him till her eyes seemed to become glowing coals that burned deep into her brain, and yet she was in mortal fear of making out the well-known features. Below her, the sea lapped softly against the rock with a splash continuous and gentle. The man said, advancing another step, I am coming for you. What do you think? She trembled. Coming for her? There was no escape, no peace, no hope. She looked round despairingly. Suddenly, the whole shadowy coast, the blurred islets, the heaven itself, swayed about twice, then came to a rest. She closed her eyes and shouted, Can't you wait till I am dead? She was shaken by a furious hate for that shade that pursued her in this world, unappeased even by death in its longing for an heir that would be like other people's children. Hey, what? said Malat, keeping his distance prudently. He was saying to himself, Look out, some lunatic, an accident happens soon. She went on wildly. I want to live, to live alone, for a week, for a day. I must explain to them. I would tear you to pieces. I would kill you twenty times over rather than let you touch me while I live. How many times must I kill you, you blasphemer? Satan sends you here. I am damned, too. Come, said Millet, are alarmed and conciliating. I am perfectly alive. Oh, my God! She screamed, Alive? and at once vanished before his eyes, as if the islet itself had swerved aside from under her feet. Millet rushed forward and fell flat with his chin over the edge. Far below he saw the water whitened by her struggles, and heard one shrill cry for help that seemed to dart upwards along the perpendicular face of the rock and soar past, straight into the high and impassive heaven. Madame Louvier sat dry-eyed on the short grass of the hillside, with her thick legs stretched out, and her old feet turned up in their black cloth shoes. Her clogs stood nearby, and further off the umbrella lay on the withered sward like a weapon, dropped from the grasp of a vanquished warrior. The Marquis of Chavannes, on horseback, one gloved hand on thigh, looked down at her as she got up laboriously with groans. On the narrow track of the seaweed carts, four men were carrying inland Susan's body on a hand barrow, while several others straggled listlessly behind. Madame Laveille looked after the procession. Yes, Monsieur le Marquis, she said dispassionately in her usual calm tone of a reasonable old woman. There are unfortunate people on this earth. I had only one child, only one, and they won't bury her in consecrated ground. Her eyes filled suddenly, and a short shower of tears rolled down the broad cheeks. She pulled the shawl close about her. The Marquis leaned slightly over in his saddle and said, it is very sad. You have all my sympathy. I shall speak to the cure. She was unquestionably insane, and the fall was accidental. Millet says so, distinctly. Good day, madame. And he trotted off, thinking to himself, I must get this old woman appointed guardian of those idiots and administrator of the farm. It would be much better than having her one of those other becadus, probably a red republican, corrupting my commune. <laughs>